We are here to talk about some Assassin's Creed. I want to hear a little bit more about uh, your all's thoughts about this new setting that you guys have headed into for both of these games. We're heading into the late 1700s, the Revolutionary War kind of time period, but more stuff on either side of that as well, right? Yeah, AC3 takes place before uh, the Revolutionary War, during the Revolutionary War, and a bit after. And uh, before, specifically, we focus on the uh, French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War, as the, it was commonly called. And the Vita game? The game starts in 1765. It takes place in New Orleans, so it's a bit different than AC3. The setting is different. It's a French colony transferred to the Spanish. And uh, when the game ends, uh, ends the actually the American Revolution uh, is in full bloom. So you basically have in all of history mm -hmm. to draw from. So what made you guys zero in on this kind of late 1700s period? It was something that was being discussed as far back as during the development of AC2. Actually, it seemed like a natural and organic extension of sort of the meta story concerning the war between the Templars and the Assassins. Um, so that's been running through all of the Assassin's Creed games is this idea of, um, you know, free will versus determinism, basically. But the Templars and the Assassins in this game aren't necessarily, in three, aren't necessarily just the British and the Americans. Am I correct? That is that? absolutely correct. It's sometimes difficult to communicate it uh, effectively, but the idea here is that you have Templars and Assassins uh, battling one another against the backdrop of the American Revolution. And it is not as simple as patriots are assassins and, uh, and Templars are like uh, evil, loyalist, uh, imperialist people. So no, you will encounter people on all sides. You will listen to multiple discussions about both sides of the argument uh, when it comes to independence versus remaining a part of the empire. So no, no. And no, Connor does not join the Patriot <laughs> Army. Uh, he does not join, like, you know what I mean? So right, it's, right. it's just no. You'll have to play the game, I guess, to see. I'm okay if, if people want to lean into that. I think it helps uh, serve the, the narrative. So go in believing that that's the case and, uh, and you'll, you'll be surprised. Be surprised. Maybe. Yeah. You, uh, realize, what about you, the, you realize they're going to edit that and it's going to be a different story, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So with the, with the Vita game... <laughs> it's going to get chopped up. Connor joins the Patriot <laughs> Army. <laughs> That's uh, okay. What, what's the setup then in the Vita game in terms of the Templars and the Assassins? Is it more clear cut down there in New Orleans? It's quite nebulous, actually. Uh, we have uh, like French and Spanish Templars uh, working together, so... It's the same, the same idea. The Assassins and Templars, they're fighting a different war. Well, and even the very nature of the way in which uh, liberation is presented, right, is different that you might want to speak to because it's kind of awesome. It's a French colony that was transferred to the Spanish and at the onset of the game in 1768, there's the Louisiana Rebellion, which is a really important event. And our protagonist, Avalon, she doesn't necessarily help the rebels. She has her own agenda. The world around her affects everything she does, but she's an assassin first and foremost. There's the frontier uh, in Assassin's Creed 3. Is there an equivalent kind of wilderness that you're exploring in Liberation? Absolutely, we have the bayou, just kind of the, kind of the same idea as the, the frontier, uh, but it's completely different. I like to call, I see the bayou as our own Dagobah. Okay. It's like very different from, from uh, I know it's weird when I say that, but it's very different from the frontier. It's a different feel, it's, uh, it's a swampy place, it's a mysterious place, and the the development team did an amazing job. Our frontier looks absolutely gorgeous. Not that yours does. Yeah, I was going to say, ours <laughs> looks absolutely gorgeous also. <laughs> they both do. What makes these two characters distinct from uh, the previous protagonists we've had in the series? The idea is that Altair fought uh, for duty. Ezio was motivated by vengeance. And I think for Connor, we wanted to do something a little bit different. And he is motivated more by a sense of justice. He has these very strong opinions uh, when it comes to right and wrong. And he sees a lot of uh, wrong being committed out in the wider world. He has injustice visited upon his people, in fact, and that's really what starts to motivate him. He finds that the assassins seem to uh, share this goal of trying to help the, the world at large. And so he heads out in search of them, hoping that they'll be able to, uh, to further train and equip him so that he can actually accomplish this goal. There's also like a sense of protection, like trying to protect his people and like their beliefs, their culture, and making sure that it continues and they're represented in this world, like they don't get um, stepped on. As Corey was saying, it all sort of fits in with uh, assassins mentality of like free choice and liberty and um, choosing your own way, choosing your own path and not being a, having anything imposed on your person. And what's sort of interesting for him is that in a certain sense we know how that story ends, especially when he, you know, he does have this, this um, partial focus on, on defending his people and ensuring that, that their way of life remains uh, undisturbed. 
and all of us living as we do now in the present, like I said, we know how, how that goes. So we also get to watch as he, you know, moves closer and closer to that realization, to that discovery. And I think there's a very major moment in the game where, where he is forced to sort of reconcile what he's done, what's coming. And I think there's a lot to be said about the way in which she decides to move forward once that realization is made. And Aveline, what, what's she all about? So Aveline is a child of mixed race, but she grew up in a privileged household. Her father is a rich French merchant. Her mother is a French uh, placé. Uh, she was born in Africa. She was um, she was a slave that was free. She was that her father freed, uh, basically. You know, growing up uh, in this really nice house, uh, having everything she ever wanted, uh, but seeing um, people around her suffer, she sort of developed her own sense of justice, uh, and she knew uh, really quickly what was wrong and what was right and she wanted to help the, these people. And so throughout the game, she, of course, she fights the Templars because they're trying to gain hold of the city. But she also goes around and frees slaves and uh, you know, sets, sets them free. Both of you guys are talking about, kind of touching on something that, that I think is really interesting about this, uh, both games, is that you have protagonists that in today's society are, are part of, of groups that we would call minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a, a significant choice that, that both of these games were going to kind of go in that direction and, and have Small protagonists forest. like that? Do you think there's something important about that for you guys? Or was it just a natural direction to go? I, I think honestly, at least for me, from my perspective, and I don't know, others may disagree, it was just a natural evolution of, of where we were going in the story that we wanted to tell. We started with the story and the themes and the experience first, and sort of the character grew out of that, rather than sitting around at a table being calculated and, and cynical about it and saying, all right, let's do this. Even Fizz was touching on it, we wanted to, we wanted the perspective of someone unfamiliar with colonial culture, for example. Uh, we wanted uh, someone that would understand how to navigate a natural environment uh, with grace and fluidity. And so it all was sort of on its own, starting from those places, at least in, in, the, in terms of Connor, moved towards someone like, uh, like Connor. It, it was just a, it was a response to the story we were trying to tell to the experience that we wanted to create and instead of vice versa. It just happened. Yeah. It also gave us an opportunity because like one of the unique things about AC3 versus the other ones is that everything is super well documented. Mm -hmm. um, so the more recent in time you are, the more documentation, the more books, the more essays are written about it. Mm -hmm. um, while as Native American culture, as documented it is, is it's a little bit more um, they hold back a little bit more on it, like to keep it within the community, because it's not as well documented. We can we, we have more flexibility, so it gives us a more of an opportunity to tell a story. In retrospect, I think that there is something really nice that we are hopefully able to show the world that uh, the race or gender of a of a protagonist does not determine success or sales, right? Um, and so if we can if we can do some good in that respect, that would that would be fantastic. But I just I think it's important to know that this wasn't motivated by stuff like that. It, w it was motivated by what best fit our story. Would you say kind of similar things about Aveline that the choice to have her be of, of partial African descent was just sort of a natural outgrowth of the kind of story you wanted to tell? Yeah, the kind of story and also um, based on the research that we did uh, when we found out about Plassage, which was a sort of a an almost natural thing uh, at the time. And when we looked at uh, influential women during the, per the period, like some of them were uh, from such unions. So that was very interesting. Well, another thing I want to talk about related to these two characters is how they link up together. Is Are, are they living in effectively two totally separate universes that happen to uh, be going on at the same time? Or are there things that connect these two characters? They are connected by a shared membership in, a, in an organization. but. To say too much, I think, would be heading into spoiler territory. There are connections be between the two of them, um, and I don't know what I'm allowed to say beyond that. Do you remember? Evelyn actually goes to New York to meet Connor. Oh, cool. And they do a mission together. If you actually play the mission and own both games, you unlock a little special thing that you can basically go back and play the mission on the Vita playing Connor. So clearly the characters have some knowledge of each other and kind of involvement with each other. Yes, like Corey said, they're, they're part of the same organization. I yeah. mean... They're I fighting might... separate battles in separate locations, but right. unified by... But they're, they're both effectively fighting the Templars on yes. different fronts. Yes, right? exactly, exactly. Well, I think that answers a lot of the questions I had. Um, so thanks a bunch for sitting down uh, with us today and for swinging by Minneapolis to come and see us. Thank you for having thanks us. Thanks for having us.